The Green Belt, by its nature, limits the Greater Toronto Area's urban growth boundaries. Joining us now to detail what that means for Toronto's growth strategy, here's Jennifer Kiesmatch. She's the Chief Planner for the City of Toronto, and we're happy to have you back here at TVO. It's great to be here. Just to bring everybody up to scratch, can we bring this map up, please, Shelton, and we'll tell everybody a bit of the brief history, a decade long, actually, of the Green Belt, which was created. Ten years ago this month, February 2005, by the McGuinty government, it protects 1.8 million acres around Ontario from development. It includes areas that had been protected by previous provincial governments, such as the Niagara Escarpment and the Oak Ridges Moraine, and there you see it, all the way in the Greater Golden Horseshoe up to Tobermory. Uh, I want to talk to you first off about housing prices because many people will argue that it stands to reason that people in the greater Toronto area are paying way too much for housing in part because this valuable land has been taken off the market. What's your view of that argument? Well, I think that argument would be true if everywhere across the greater Toronto and Hamilton area houses were expensive. But in fact, we know they're not. We know they that. Well, house prices vary. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go out to Oshawa, you, you know, a price for a, you know, an average size house, the average home price is between 250000 and 275000 uh, If you go into downtown Toronto, right in the core of the city, it's about $1.4 The Toronto city average is about 800000 Isn't that unbelievable? So there's, it is unbelievable. You shake your head Just at those like numbers? Huge, huge numbers. No. Uh, so, you know, if the price was the same everywhere, I think that would be true. It would also be true if the land was built out. But we know we still have a significant amount of land where over 800,000 single-family homes have been approved, but they're not yet built. Hmm. So why are those houses not built if there's a market to build them? So I think the argument would hold if, in fact, there was no more land left to build, but there's still a significant amount of land within the buildable area that is available to build on. Do you think that argument's a tough sell? And I only ask that because uh, I saw the piece you did in the Globe and Mail. You did an op-ed piece. And there were, you know, a, a good number of comments below there where people were saying, what do you, you know, we're not buying. If you take this much land off the market, it stands to reason that what's left is going to be more expensive. Tough sell, this argument? Well, I think a very, if you take a very simple kind of supply and demand lens to this argument, I think it, that would in fact make sense. But housing doesn't actually work like that, in part because there are locational factors that determine where people choose to live. So one of the challenges that we have is that the prices are very high and are raising very quickly where we have our best transit investments and where we have most of our mixed use communities where there's a lot of amenities within walking distance. So really the demand that's driving up housing prices isn't on those edges where the green belt is. The demand that's driving up housing prices is along our main transit corridors and walkable neighborhoods. So you can look at the market. The market actually tells the story because it's those main corridors where the prices are the highest. It's also important to note that between 1999 and 2001, uh, the urban footprint of the greater Toronto Hamilton area grew by about 24% to add one million people. So that's between 1999 and 2001. Now, if we look at the data from 2001 to 2010, we see a very different story. What happens is the same amount of people, about one million people are accommodated, but the urban footprint only grows by 7%, not 24%, so 7%. More intensification. More happening. intensification. So what's happening is the demand is growing, not on the edges, because that land is, exists. Mm -hmm. There's 30 years worth of development on the edges that we might not even need because there's so much demand for housing within walkable areas in areas where there's transit. So the affordable housing problem is really a challenge, not on the edges, that's where housing is most affordable, mm -hmm. and that's where we have capacity to build more. Really, the affordability issue is in those walkable, transit-oriented communities. Typically, when people say, well, housing isn't affordable, what they really mean is, housing isn't affordable in the neighborhood that I want to live in. And the neighborhood I want to live in is a neighborhood where there's transit, where there's a mix of uses, uh, that's close to my job, that doesn't result in a long commute. That's really the, the subtext to the affordability question. So the, would you say there's any connection at all between the condo building boom in Toronto and the effort to 
take the green belt out of the housing market? Well, I think it's important to link together a few things that are absolutely linked. And importantly, the story of what's happening in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area isn't just about the Green Belt, it's also about places to grow. Because the Places to Grow Act, uh, and this was quite clever actually pairing this legislation together, because on the one hand, the Green Belt was about protecting growth and saying, protecting areas and saying, you know, this farmland really matters as farmland and we don't really see the benefits of sprawling indefinitely. Places to Grow was about directing growth to places where we've already made investments in existing infrastructure, where we already have transit, where we already have sewers and sidewalks and schools. So Places to Grow sets a whole series of very aggressive targets for Mississauga, for Vaughan, for Brampton, for Markham, for Toronto to be accommodating a high percentage of growth in areas where infrastructure already exists. And so it's those two factors taken together that really leads to this outcome of what we're seeing right now, which is a, which is a condo boom. And how well do you think the Places to Grow Act and the ramifications in it are working so far? Well, I think they're going really well in some areas, not as well in others. One of the great things that Places to Grow did for the first time was link together targets around housing and jobs recognizing that the extent to which we create places, as opposed to the traditional suburb, to the extent to which we create places where people can both live and work, we'll be reducing our environmental footprint, we'll be reducing our traffic congestion, because you have shorter commutes. The extent to which we separate those uses results in traffic congestion because people have to commute every single day as a core mm -hmm. part of their lives. So linking those two things together was a really important strategic move. Now. Different municipalities have had different levels of success at actually meeting their targets and even within the City of Toronto we've had no problem as you can appreciate meeting our targets in the downtown core where we're going four times faster than we are in the rest of the city but we've struggled with some of our other centers. Young and Eglinton hasn't been a problem but with some of our other centers we've struggled to attract the jobs that we need to be ensuring we're creating complete communities. I was just going to say that you know the given the economy of the last five six years the the jobs that you need and want to propel all of the other developments haven't been happening. So how does it happen? How does the whole, how does the big picture happen well, if the jobs aren't there? Well, this is, you know, planning can't do everything. That's, right. You know, right. We, we can do a lot, but we can't do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and this planning policy does a lot, but it doesn't do everything as well. So facilitating through economic development and strong economic development policies, facilitating job growth, and also making sure that it's real job growth, that we're not just kind of stealing growth from one another mm -hmm. as a region. We need to be bringing growth into the region, not just shifting it around. Mm -hmm. No one really wins if we do that in the end. So focusing on job growth within our region is really a critical part of ensuring that we have longevity. And we've actually done fairly well on job growth. Uh, we just released some data yesterday, our 2014 employment survey, where we conduct extensive primary research across the city of Toronto. And it's interesting to look at, you know, there's some surprising trends. One of them is that the institutional job growth is in fact up significantly in the city of Toronto uh, last year. So seeing institutions growing has been an important part of continuing to diversify the economy. When you say institutional, do you mean public sector? Yeah, public, se well, universities, colleges, uh, anything, hospitals, they would fall under that institutional mm. banner as well. Lots of conservatives might not think that's a very good idea. Anyway, that's another Maybe. show. That's another <laughs> show. Tell me this, uh, the, the so-called dream of having uh, not an intensified house, but a, you know, a sprawling two-car garage, big backyard, picket fence, all of that business, should we really be leaving that behind? I don't think we, I don't think we are leaving that behind. Uh, that continues to be a choice uh, within a suite of a whole variety of other choices. And in fact, if you, um, you know, drive out to Vaughan or to Brampton, you'll see that there's great big suburban homes being built today. They're all, you know, just the, they're framed, but they're not completely finished. They're being built today. There continues to be a market for that housing. And I think that uh, as long as there's a market for it, it will continue to be built because there is still a considerable amount of supply. Well, what my we guess is that's not your favorite kind of housing. Well, for me, uh, you know, I prefer a walkable community. That's something that's a key priority for me. I like kind of bringing uses in close, in part because I've just never been a commuter. I have commuted. I went to York University, and I commuted every day out to York University, and I lost 
I don't know, three hours of my life every single day. Yep. And I think it was pretty much at that point in my life where I said, you know what, this isn't on for me. I don't want to live this way. I would rather pay a little bit more and live in a smaller footprint, but know that I've got more time with my family, more time in my community. Those are, those are the choices that I've made. But we know from some of the research that's been undertaken recently by RC, uh, um, RBC and the Pembina Institute that uh, over 86% of uh, Ontarians also want, would make that choice and in fact our market shows that because that's precisely where housing is most expensive mm -hmm. in those areas where you do get a smaller house but you're close to transit and close to other amenities. And again for those who say that the condo boom in Toronto has meant that there aren't um, there aren't enough places for families to build homes in the city is there any truth to that in your view? Oh, I think there is truth to that. In, in my view, I think there is truth to, truth to that, and it's something that we're really struggling with. Um, and it's not as simple as saying, let's ensure that in our condo buildings we have three-bedroom condos. Uh, we've been doing that. There have been some struggles with that. Of course, as the condo gets larger, they get significantly more expensive, with puts them, which puts them out of reach for yeah. families. I do think part of the answer is our mid-rise our mid-rise housing because on our avenues mid-rise units tend to be larger. Mid-rise mid is how big? So mid-rise is between 6 and 11 stories okay. on our transit corridors and they are a part of neighborhoods where there are schools and community centers. So that's what makes them a really critical addition to the housing stock. But I, I think this is, a, this is a critical question for us to struggle with in the mm. city. Let's, we're going to put up, uh, Sheldon, if you would, the map on page three here because Environmental Defense made a list of so-called threats to the Greenbelt. And on their list, they included a proposed airport for Pickering, which, as we know, has been proposed for 40 Ever. years. Yeah, for at least four decades. Hasn't happened yet. Uh, the proposed GTA West Highway that would link Milton and Vaughan. Uh, these are the threats that are on their list. And, I mean, obviously, this is all about balancing environmental sustainability with the added infrastructure that even planners like you want to see happen for the whole region to make it work. How do you find the balance? Well, you know, it's tricky um, and it's interesting about the airport um, and I don't know what the status of that is today, um, but typically a peripheral location is a good location for an airport because there's lots of surface uses that demand a tremendous amount of land. That being said, uh, we're constantly trying to recognize the importance, and I think this is a shift in planning thinking that's really taken place over the past 20 years. Why are we building new infrastructure when we have existing infrastructure that's underutilized? Such as? Well, in the city of Toronto, we have 362 kilometers of avenues. Most of those avenues have planning permissions for a five-story building, as of right, but most of them currently have two-story buildings on them. So there's densification that can happen on those sites there's infrastructure adjacent to those sites there's there's water there's electrical there's all the other amenities that you need and yet we haven't fully yet built out the built form on those avenues why wouldn't we better use that infrastructure that we've already invested in before we build new infrastructure elsewhere and i think that's a really important critical part of the question around use building in our built up areas as opposed to putting in new infrastructure mm. in other areas. That, that m makes common sense, so why isn't it happening? Well, it is happening because we've seen that shift, as I mentioned to you, the way the urban footprint is now uh, becoming smaller. We're not growing at the same rate mm -hmm. that they were, we were but two decades ago. But there's still some sprawl though, right? Well, you can't have it both ways, Steve. Mm. You, want it, you asked about choice, right? <laughs> about yeah. have people having the opportunity to choose that sprawling family home. And from my perspective, absolutely, that should be a choice. Uh, if that's the choice that you want to make, I also think you should pay for it because there's infrastructure costs that come with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, if, if someone chooses to have a longer commute and to live on the edge or wants a, to, to pay less for a home and have a longer commute, you know, that's a very personal choice. Uh, and I think that it's a choice that, um, that is a choice that should be available as long as there isn't a societal cost that we're absorbing on the infrastructure side. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the trade-off that we're trying to negotiate. Okay, in our last few minutes here, you know the province is about to undertake this sort of Greenbelt's been around for 10 years, and they're now going to take a look 10 years forward and see what kinds of changes, if any, ought to be done. What's at the top of your list? Well, I think, um, I think it's really important to continue to reinforce the Greenbelt as being a critical part 
of not only um, our ecology as a region, but also our economy as a region. So no exceptions. No make, exceptions. Make, keep those yeah. lines. Keep those lines firm. There. Yeah, mm -hmm. and green belts around the world have been successful when they have in fact had a lot of integrity. Uh, we like to talk about Portland's green belt because it was one of the first 40 years ago, and it has been very successful. But they have chipped away at it over the years, and I think um, you know it's like unraveling the string on a sweater. Mm. Uh, it makes me very nervous because I think once you begin to unravel it, mm, where do you draw the line? So I think if we're going to continue to provide some certainty with respect to our land economics in the region, it's critical to continue to enforce and reinforce a green belt and the hard line of the green belt as being a very important policy direction for the province. Uh, I know you're not a politician. I know you're a, you're a public servant. However, you do have a bit of a front row seat on how lobbying works. And there are developers who will give politicians contributions to be used towards elections and who knows what else in order to try to get exemptions to that legislation that we've been talking about. How, how do you make sure the line is firm? Well, you bet. You know, that's a, that's a reality of, um, of politics in Ontario and of politics in most places. In fact, um, I've been kind of uh, really struggling with this whole narrative around Greenbelt and affordability because I just think it's a narrative that if you look at the market in the region, it's a, it's a very believable one, but if you look at the market in the region, it, it just doesn't hold true because our highest prices are in our most urban places. That's where the demand is. So, you know, I've had my own conspiracy theories about where that argument is coming from. And I think this is why it's important to be having conversations, to be bringing facts and data into these conversations and building a broader understanding of how critical the green belt is to the successful future of this province. And this, this is about access to food over the long term. Mm -hmm. It's also about shortening our commute times and not in creating sprawl that is in fact going to be detrimental to the region over the long term. But it's also about livability and quality of life. It's about building places where people are going to have a very high quality of life. And it's ensuring that we have lots of choice uh, within our region. That's the chief planner for the City of Toronto, Jennifer Keysmat. Thanks for coming into TVO tonight, getting us started tonight. My pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.